Welcome to the Pink Tax Podcast, a no-nonsense podcast for millennial women, building wealth and smashing the patriarchy, one dollar at a time, with your hosts, Janine and Tara. Tara. How are you doing? I'm good. Can you believe that this is the last episode of season one? I cannot. It seems like such a crazy process and it's gone by so fast, but also not. I don't know. (laughs) It's been, I feel like it's gone really fast. It's been a, a pretty interesting experience for sure. Yeah, we've, you know, just so all our listeners know, we pre recorded season one. Um, just based on how busy our lives are and stuff. And so it's September 2nd and we're recording the last episode and we're getting excited and very busy for the launch of the podcast. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Are you ready to talk about student loans? I our am, last topic? yeah. Cool. Okay, let's jump in. So I guess I've had kind of a shorter experience with student loans than most people have. I ended up repaying mine relatively quickly, so I just wanted to ask you to start this off. What do you wish you knew before you took out a student loan? For me, I, I'll maybe back up and share a little bit about my student loan experience. So I applied for student loans on my third or my fourth year of university, and I was really fortunate that my parents paid for my post-secondary uh, education, so I didn't need it for schooling, but I had moved out by that time. And um, I guess I wish I would have known maybe what my income would have done to my qualification because I did do a co-op term in in the middle of my degree. And so I think I ended up making like $30,000 one year because I was in a co-op term for eight months. And then I didn't qualify for, I guess, student loans the following year. Like I, I think I got like $700 or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I wouldn't trade that experience with the world. I definitely learned a lot from my co-op term, but um, I didn't realize how me earning an income of $30,000, which is still really low, mm-hmm. especially with tuition prices today, how that would affect student loan qualification down the road. Yeah, I mean, if that were your annual income, $30,000, like that's regardless of if you're going to school or not, that's just going to cover your basic expenses, if that. Yeah, and I think... Maybe one of the downsides of student loans is that until a certain age, your parents' income is taken into account. Mm -hmm. And so if you have parents that are like middle to high income earners, which I was very fortunate mine were, uh, you don't qualify for any regardless of, you know, whether or not they're actually helping you with post-secondary. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you have high earning parents and they've said that they're not paying for your university and you can't tell people how to spend their money, right? Mm Mm-hmm then I think you could find yourself in a little bit of a predicament, perhaps. Yeah, and I know I started my student loan journey as soon as I went to school, and I applied right off the bat, um, but didn't qualify for really anything. Um, My second year is when it started because I had been living on my own, um, doing all that kind of thing, so moving away from university. Uh, For me, what I wish I had known before getting into student loan, I guess, would have been the full cost of the program, because I think you're kind of young, you're 17 or 18, and you look at, okay, that's my tuition, that's my books, that's my living expense, and if you haven't been paying for that kind of stuff, doing that kind of math in advance of getting the loan, you don't realize how quickly everything's going to add up. And I think if you are living on your own, you know, the other things to consider are things like, you know, fun expenses or going out mm-hmm. for dinner and, you know, taking a trip. Like I, I saw a lot of people, especially in um, med school, and we can talk about med school a little bit later maybe because mm-hmm. I have some thoughts on that. But, you know, I see people take trips with their student loans and I don't think they really understand how much it's going to cost them in the long run or how long it's mm-hmm. going to take them to pay it back. Yeah, and... And financing that. I mean, I guess it's better than using your credit card, but um, when you delay the repayment for that long, it doesn't have the same emotional cost right off the hop, so. Yeah, and I mean, using your credit card, that's a pretty low bar, so. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, you know, obviously costs associated with living when you're a student, and that's what your student loans are for, that intuition. But I've seen some people go a little bit crazy because, you know, they think they have 10 years to repay it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's get into why student loans would be a good option to pay for your schooling. So let's see, what are the other options that we can think of? I guess working Mm -hmm. for money. The downside to that, obviously, would be when you're in school, there can be a lot of pressure to get good grades, especially if you want to go into like a a program after you're done your undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. And so working... 20 to 30 hours a week while you're going to school full-time probably could seem like a a lot of work or could, you know, affect your grades. The other one that I used and had um, available to me when I moved out was I got a student line of credit Mm -hmm. just to be there. I don't think I ever ended up actually using it, but it was there as kind of like a safety net in case I had to use it for um, expenses or what have you, while I was going to school. Yeah, and I did kind of a mix of, I worked as well as got a student loan. Um, And I can say there were times where I was working 20 to 30 hours a week, and it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to maintain your grades. And I remember going into a counselor's office in my third year, I believe, and saying, you know, why have I had a dip? Like, I really need help. And um, they just said to me, you need to not, work on Thursdays maybe like just cut out one day a week of working and you might see an increase in your grades it's hard though and you know some people don't have that option for Mm -hmm. cutting a day out of work that might mean like rent or Mm -hmm. that might mean food like there are a lot of students that maybe they don't have the support of their parents they can't live at home they have to They are on their own and they have to pay for everything by themselves at the age of 18. So I think that that is kind of terrible advice. (laughs) Yeah, it wasn't the greatest. I mean, I was lucky enough that it was a phone call to say, hey, I'm going to try this out for the next two months. Can you cover my rent? And that was fine. But uh, yeah, at that point, I was paying for my own rent. I was paying for my own uh, car uh, maintenance and everything like that and food and everything. (laughs) Yeah, I guess another way you could finance your post-secondary is through scholarships and bursaries. But again, Mm -hmm. a lot of the bursaries and grants go to low-income individuals, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. But um, scholarships, typically, you need to have high GPA. So Mm -hmm. it's like this weird, vicious cycle where you need good grades to get the money. Mm -hmm. But you have to work also because you need money and then Mm -hmm. working too much can decrease your grades, which means maybe you don't get scholarships. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting environment, um, academia at any level. So yeah, so we've talked about a couple of the options and I kind of thought about the working while going to school. I mean, there are different ways to float that too. You could take a gap year and work and try to save up enough. I don't know with tuition prices and cost of living what they are now. If that would actually be feasible. I have a feeling it wouldn't be. Um, you could try to get your employer to pay for it, but I've noticed unless you already have an undergrad of some kind, it's really difficult to get your employer to pay for your schooling, which was not the case when our parents were younger. Yeah, and then so we have covering it with uh, a different form of credit. So let's, uh, we had the listener question of should you get uh, sort of like a line of credit or student loan from a financial institution versus getting a student loan from the government? That's the right question, right? I think it was just student loan versus line of credit. Oh, student loan versus line of credit. Okay, so um, the student loan that the government offers, the national and the provincial, I looked at the national rates just so that we look at it. It's pretty low. It looks like prime plus 2% if you get floating, prime plus 5% if you choose the fixed option. The provincial rates vary. Yeah, I think for Alberta, they're a little bit lower than the Canada rates. Mm -hmm. Um, I only ever had Alberta student loans. I didn't qualify for Canadian student loans. I mean, actually interesting enough, and I'm sure we can talk about repayment journeys a little bit later, but last month, so August, I actually put my last payment towards my student loan. And so we'll we'll talk about that because I think I had a very interesting approach to paying off my student loan. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. So this episode is very timely. 
Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, but yeah, the repayment period is pretty awesome when you look at it compared to a traditional line of credit. So whatever credit facility you would be opening other than a government student loan, you would have the obligation to pay back something. It might just be interest. It might be a lower um, payment, but you still have to pay some of it back while you're in school. It doesn't matter. While you're in school with the government loans, you don't have to pay anything back. Um, and you don't actually have to pay any ba anything back until that six-month grace period is over, though the interest does start accruing. Yeah, and so for anyone who doesn't know what accruing means, that means the interest is starting to calculate and it will c all of that interest over the six months will be added to the balance of your student loan. Yeah. Now, quick question. Do you know, on average, what a typical student line of credit or line of credit or loan from a financial institution, what the repayment period would be in general? Because I guess for... Alberta student loans, it's 10 years, which is, yeah. I feel like a long time. That is a long time. So terms on most loans, I think max out at around five years. So that would be when we talked about the credit piece. That's not a line of credit. That's a loan similar to your car loan. You get a five-year term or a three-year term or a one-year term. With a line of credit, that's more like your credit card. I'm not sure how all the student line of credits go. Some may convert to a loan at a certain point. But either way, if it's a line of credit and just a line of credit, you're going to have access to it again. Line of credit rates... I don't think you'd get just prime for sure. And it would be based on your credit history. So you might even need a cosigner. If you're 18 and you've never worked before, I don't know if you would necessarily qualify. I just pulled up the RBC student line of credit because that's actually where I got my student line of credit. And then mm -hmm. my husband, when he was doing his designation, got his student line of credit or a professional student line of credit. And it's actually, I'm surprised by this, prime minus 0.25%. Based on, pro bad. based on program of study, budget, and qualification. So Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too. So these, the student loans are just, again, based on your parents' income, your income, and if you're going to school or not. The other facilities line of credits and loans and those kind of things, it's going to be based on you and whoever else is liable on the loan. That might be you and your parents. It might just be you. Um, and the interest rates are going to change based on what you qualify for and the amounts are going to change based on your program type, your income level currently, and your credit history. Those, the interest will start accruing so you will have to start either repaying or you will be charged interest as soon as you start using that money. So if you got a traditional loan, it's going to be given to you at that time. You start um, having interest owing on that immediately. With a line of credit is as soon as you take a dollar out of it, you're going to get charged interest on it. The student loan has that nice, while you're studying, no interest. Yeah, and I think my experience with the student line of credit was you actually do have to pay that interest while you're mm -hmm. in school, like every month. Let's yeah. say it's $5 or whatever. And yeah. I actually just clicked in again. You have no affiliate with RBC. That's literally just the one I, my mm -hmm. husband and I use. But it says get two years after graduation before you have to start repaying the principal. Limit is based on your borrowing needs. And you do re actually require a cosigner. So that mm -hmm. could be something that is going to stop you from getting a student line of credit is if you don't have access to a cosigner because mm -hmm. you don't need a cosigner for student loans no. with the government. No. And I know I tried to apply for a line of credit in my last year or I ended up studying after I got my degree in open studies and I wanted a different option, like a more flexible option. And I didn't qualify because I wasn't a full-time student anymore. And I didn't have the income to carry like a traditional line of credit, right? So if you want to talk to somebody about it, but it seems like the government loans are really good when you think about it. And on that, one of the things that I think is interesting about the, the government loans is the interest that you actually end up paying on that loan is tax deductible on mm -hmm. your tax return, which is not going to be the case on, you know, any other loan or, or a line of credit as well. No, exactly. Yeah, you won't get a, a tax credit for that. And you don't get the same kind of repayment flexibility. So it's typically, I looked at the national one, nine and a half years. I had a national and Alberta one. I feel like it was around a nine year repayment period when I got mine with the line of credit. Maybe you can speak to this having like personal experience. But if it's a line of credit, it's just when you want to pay it off. If it's a loan, I've, the maximum terms I've seen is five years. I think typically with the lines of credit, they do a calculation that will determine based on whatever their math is in, in their system, 
that will determine, you know, how much you have to pay. So, you know, my mm-hmm. husband used a, a professional line of credit while he was doing his designation. And they said, you know, once he was no longer a student, because of course, if you have a student line of credit, you have to prove that you're a student mm-hmm. every year. So mm-hmm. you have to show up with a bunch of paperwork. And that can be frustrating too. But they basically said once he was done his designation, like this is the amount you have to pay each month. And so mm-hmm. it kind of, it, it did in a sense turn into a loan. Turn into a loan. So and, yeah. you don't have access to that line of credit forever. Mm, okay. if, it, if it's a student line of credit. If it's a traditional line of credit that has nothing to do with going to school, which I think the interest would probably be higher, then mm-hmm. I guess you could just continuously pull and repay and pull and repay. Yeah. And from what I've seen, it's the student line of credits do turn into a, a loan and you don't have access to it again. And then the student line of credit interest rate is lower than that institution's regular loan rate. But I can't speak to all the institutions that are there right now. Yeah. And there is the opportunity for repayment assistance with the government student loans. I don't know what the negotiation process would be like at an institution. You'd probably have to pay for insurance. So if you weren't able to repay it for injury or that kind of thing, you could pay for that. But in terms of financial hardship, I don't know what that would look like at a institution. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I was never in that situation, thank goodness. Mm-hmm. But I know with the uh, repayment assistance, typically from what I read, I think it's if you're earning below a certain amount, you can mm-hmm. also get um, kind of those loans or payments pushed off into the future. You can delay them. And again, yeah, I don't know how flexible a financial institution would be. My guess would be not as flexible as, as the government. I'm guessing not as flexible. And like I come from an arts background and I did know a few people who did have to do the repayment ins- assistance just because the industry that they were going into isn't as lucrative as most um, and did delay those payments. And it seemed relatively simple not a great position to be in obviously obviously but yeah simple and we can maybe include the links to some of the resources around you know help with your student loans mm-hmm. getting them to be kind of deferred if you know you're I think off the top of my head I want to say it's like if you earn under twenty five thousand dollars a year after you graduate that's that's what my my brain tells me but I'm sure we can confirm that and you know send yeah. out some information with that as well if you find yourself in a position where maybe you're not feeling like you can make those payments on your student loans um, Mm -hmm. because you're not earning enough yeah yeah and then uh, another thing I saw there is there is loan forgiveness for doctors and nurses that work in rural communities so that's Mm. cool as well I did not know that so yeah yeah. if you're a doctor or a nurse maybe work in a rural community so there is the option for loan forgiveness for doctors and nurses working in rural communities super fun and then we had the question on should you or would you ever use a line of credit to repay your student loan yeah and I think I've gotten this question a few times when there are two people that are going to school in a household and there is maybe one that graduates first and one that has access to a line of credit. An example might be, you know, someone does their undergrad and then someone goes back for another, I guess, degree, like whether that's becoming a doctor or getting an MBA or whatever. And then they get access to student loans again. So kind of both ways, should you use student loans to pay off a line of credit if that's what you have outstanding? Or if you get access to a line of credit later in life, should you use that to pay off your student loans? Mm -hmm. And I think... I typically caution people, and this probably comes into a little bit of my repayment story, I typically caution people away from paying off debt that you can deduct on Mm -hmm. a tax return as fast as they possibly can. And I know debt repayment is something that's hugely personal and people may have reasons that they want to repay that debt. Maybe it's emotional Um, And I'm obviously not talking about like super high interest debt right now. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about lower interest debt. But with a line of credit or a loan, if if you're using it to earn income, so whether you use it to invest in a business or invest in the stock market, that interest is deductible on a tax return, as well as the interest on uh, Canadian and I guess in this case, Albertan student loans, that interest is also deductible. So I would say that having those interest payments, even if they are maybe like half a percent higher, Mm -hmm. is probably the better of the two just because you do get that deduction at tax time yeah and I'm I'm apprehensive to take any 
debt and repay it with a debt. To my mind, it, it overcomplicates your personal finance. You could probably use that brain power for something else when you're looking at, okay, if I look at the tax credit that I'm going to get versus the lower interest rate here, the government loans, they're super flexible. And I don't think we mentioned it, but you can increase the repayment period with an application up to like 14 and a half years with the national ones. They've got so many options for repayment assistance. It just seems like pretty well set up it's, you know, debt that you went into thinking that this would help you earn more in the future. So I just don't know why you'd overcomplicate it. But if you look at a line of credit and it's a really great deal and you've already got, you know, a two to five year repayment plan set up for you and you don't think you're going to end up paying more interest because rather than having the nine years, you're going to use a line of credit for the rest of your life, that kind of thing. It may make sense to you, but it's going to be a numbers game and it's a personal number get personal numbers game. Yeah, and, and that's exactly it. It's going to be different for everyone and everyone's situation is, of course, going to be different depending on the amount and um, period to repay. I, again, have taken the position that, you know, rushing to pay off your student loans at the expense of saving and investing, to me, is not the right way and it's not as balanced as maybe it could be. Mm -hmm. So again, diving maybe a little bit deeper into my story, I for sure could have, I think I ended up taking out like $7,000 from student loans. So not that much at all compared to like what a lot of people have graduated with. Mm -hmm. So I ended up with pretty okay paying job out of university. And I had kind of begun my obsession with personal finance at that point. So I, I had over $7,000 invested when mm -hmm. I graduated. And so I definitely could have completely just wiped that out. But I've always kind of taken the approach of building my investment portfolio and savings while, you know, getting this low interest loan from the government, that's the interest is actually tax deductible. So mm -hmm. it took me, what is that, five years to pay it off, to pay mm -hmm. off $7,000. So you can see that I was pretty much making the minimum payment. Plus, I think after a couple of years, I like doubled it mm -hmm. to pay it off. And that just maybe it was annoying to look at on my net worth statement. But, you know, I never pulled $7,000 or $5,000 out of an investment and threw it at that student loan, which I know some people do. And in the personal finance community, I have seen, you know, people who are really, really, really aggressive into paying off their debt as fast as they possibly can. And I would just caution that, you know, having security around an emergency fund or some, some money mm -hmm. invested, if you remember from our investing episode, we just want everyone to get started. Mm -hmm. I think that it can be, I guess, detrimental to your financial health in the long term if you just only focus on paying down that debt. And I will now get off my soapbox. No, that's <laughs> fine. No, and I think we did talk about that in an earlier episode, having that balance and why you need that balance, you know, to have something to fall back on. And I, I'm of the same mindset. I'm hard-pressed to find a really good reason to pay off low-interest debt faster than your term requires if you are earning more by investing. I, I don't get it. Yeah. And I think by the end of, because interest rates have obviously been increasing. Mm -hmm. So I think by the end of my student loan journey, it was at like 4.2%. And I think it mm -hmm. started at like 3.5. But again, like when I look at my stock market returns, you know, I've consistently earned double digits mm -hmm. over the, over that five year period. So to me, it's like, why would I pull money out to pay off debt that, I mean, it's probably also helping my credit. It's very low interest. It's costing yeah. me, what, like $3 a month at this point. And that, again, I get, a, get to write that off. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was my point around not overly rushing to pay off your student loans. That being said, you know, if you have a lot, maybe if you mm -hmm. had six figures, you know, you might want to try and throw some extra payments at that because that could be a huge financial burden as well you know my yeah. payments were $75 a month I didn't really even notice it happening yeah my payments were significantly higher than that but I had 20,000 out and did take just a couple of years to repay that so I had a pretty aggressive debt repayment plan, but we were also living well below our means on so many other sides of it too. You know, not really having any car loans, not having transportation maintenance, living close to our places of work, and still making time to do debt re repayment and to save and invest. But I think when I first graduated, it was heavy on the debt repayment and a little bit less on the investing because I was just dipping my toes in there. So For sure. And I think that that's a great point. Your balance 
is going to change or your allocation of your money is going to change over the course of your lifetime. So mm-hmm. maybe it's 80-20 at the beginning, 80% debt, 20% investing or 90-10. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as the years go by, maybe it becomes 50-50. And then as you kind of have like less and less debt to pay off, maybe it becomes, you know, 80-20 the other way. And mm-hmm. it, it, you're allowed to be flexible and you're allowed to change yeah. what you're doing for debt repayment. Yeah. Now I have a question for you. I know this, you're supposed to be asking the questions and I mm-hmm. feel like this always happens. Did your partner have debt and how did you guys attack that as a couple? Did one of you pay for each other's debt or what, like what kind of, tell me about that. Uh, yeah, my husband was incredibly fortunate in where he came from and had his complete undergrad paid for. He's also brilliant. He is. I can vouch for that. He is brilliant. He. I didn't know about class rankings or anything like that. I'm just going to shout out to him here. He was top. He was the second person in his graduating class, I think, for all the degrees he has. He's got a little, yeah, it shows you right on your. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, I don't yeah. have that on so my So he's, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he was literally uh, the, the second person. Only one person beat him out in terms of grades and everything like that. Anyway, so he got all the scholarships. He got all those kind of things. And so he did have a small amount of debt, less than 5000 Good for him. <laughs> and uh, the career that he went into, it just made sense for him to just take his, you know, first or second paycheck and just pay it all back in one go and away we went. So it was my debt that was the thing. And um, I, you know, took on that debt before I met him. I was in my last year of schooling when we got together. So it was kind of already on track for me. It was never something we talked about as a couple. We got into joint debt when we got our condo and our house and that kind of thing. But we've just taken our total household expenses and our total household income and we've always split it, you know, 30, 70 or 40, 60, that kind of thing. Um, and that's dependent on income, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes, how that's, you're that's split. totally, yeah, exactly. Okay. So if he is bringing in 60% of the income, he gets 60% of the household expenses and then we always give each other. Um, like when we're discussing this, we always like say this is, you know, our discretionary spending. I don't care what you spend it on. I don't care if you come home with a TV or an ATV or that we would never do that. But you know what I mean? As long as it's not eating into the family budget, I, I don't care. So where does, where did your student loan debt repayment come in? Was it part of your discretionary spending or was it a different expense for the household? I kept it as part of my de- discretionary spending and that was you know, my personal decision because I signed up for it. It wasn't a huge amount when we looked at our like total income, but it was like something that I wanted to be able to do for myself. I got myself into it. I did it for a reason. I'll just be fully clear. I was in an arts program. I did not have a lot of uh, options coming out of that. And I just wanted to see if it was possible. Like, why should I, I I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> it's just the personal decision that I made, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, again, it's always going to be personal for every single individual, but, you know, it is something to discuss with your partner how, like, if, you, if you're if you coming into the, the relationship with debt, like, what mm-hmm. that looks like, what that repayment plan looks like, um, and what the expectations are for that mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Now, do yeah. you, I don't know if you looked this up, but do, what do you think the relationship with student debt for women is compared to men? Yeah, I looked up a couple of things. So in Canada, the uh, average cost, like the average amount of debt that you're in when you graduate with a bachelor's degree is just somewhere over 26000 It's not split by gender or anything like that. But that's the average amount of debt that you're coming out with. What year was that? That seems low to me. It is a bit low. Um, 2015. Wow. So Stats Canada is a little bit behind. For sure, they always are. No offense, Stats Canada. Um, but yeah, so that's the average. It can be more or less, but that's just for a bachelor's degree. If you look at a technical degree, it's a different amount. If you look at a master's and a PhD, it's a different amount, right? So that's just for a bachelor's. So I just took it. It's, it's a medium degree term, that kind of thing. Also, 41% of the people in 2017 that graduated from a bachelor's have more than 25000 in debt. So that's the average, but we all know the average is, you know, can be skewed this way or that way. So I, it's right. probably skewed a little yeah. bit low if 41% of people are graduating with more than 25000 in debt. Well, if you think, I'm probably one of those people that skewed it, right? I had $7,000 yeah, and I did five years in university because of my co-op term. So yeah. how dare yeah. I? <laughs> 
How dare I skew, skew the average? You skewed the average. Get out of the mean. Anyway, so that's the average. And then when we look at this uh, study that just recently came out at time of recording, where, you know, the average starting wage for a guy uh, with a bachelor's degree is 54000 but the average starting wage for a gal with a bachelor's degree is 50000 And if you look at college, so I, I believe when they're saying college, I think they mean like SAID or NAID or like a two-year, it's just anything that's not a bachelor's. So like a... I think you can get a degree at a college. Oh yeah, no, you for sure can. You for sure can, but it'll be like an associate's oh, okay. yeah, degree yeah. or diploma program, that kind of thing. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a four-year program. It just it's not labeled as a bachelor's degree. Yeah, so it's saying college is uh, men will typically earn forty-five thousand a year, and women will earn thirty-eight thousand with the same degree. So you know if you're getting into a situation where your earning potential is that you're going to be graduating with 50% of your starting wage in debt, that really lowers what you can do in terms of uh, flexibility and lifestyle coming out of school. One thing that I found interesting, Tara, when I was kind of looking a little bit for this episode was that, I, and I, I know you said you couldn't see the split for male and female in Canada, and I kind of found the same thing, but I did find it for the U.S., and, you know, we are pretty close to the U.S. in terms mm-hmm. of demographics. Women in the U.S. shoulder two-thirds of the student debt in, mm-hmm. in America, which ends up being, like, $890 billion, which is insane. The U.S. obviously has a huge um, cost to go to school. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we were just talking about women earning less in some of those situations and then carrying more of the debt. I guess, what are your thoughts on that and what can women do to, I guess, help decrease the burden on themselves in society? Yeah, so I think I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Canadian numbers that parallel that. Just because when you think of the wage gap and you're, say, working for four months out of the summer, it's very likely that a lady is going to be earning significantly less in her summer job than a man would be. Look at even just the representation of some um, labor jobs. So if you wanted to go get a construction job in the summer, you just see fewer women in there. And I don't think it's the time to like get into why, but we do know that that's a more higher earning position, right? If you look into something like retail, it's heavily skewed towards the ladies and it's lower paying or childcare or anything yeah. like that, right? So I think when you come into, let's say your first year, let's say you just start at the, the base, you have a man and a woman and their parents earned the same amount and they're set up in the same way. But then when they go to get their summer work or they go to get their internship, they're, the woman is felt uh, facing all these additional challenges and income restrictions and not able to build that. So I would say if you're facing all those things, it's very likely that you're going to get into more debt For than sure. somebody who has more opportunity. And if you th- actually, I never thought about it from that perspective of um, summer jobs, but yeah, you're starting to already see the wage gap in your first year of university. I worked for, I worked in Edmonton for a couple of my summer jobs. It wasn't construction, but it was an outdoor manual labor job. And I earned a great wage. I think I earned $21 an hour back in 2000 and which was fantastic but I was pretty much the only female Mm -hmm. there so Mm -hmm. I totally see what you mean and I hated that job I didn't like it paid so well so it was so hard to not take it on and I actually Mm -hmm. didn't stop working there in the summers until I was kind of in more of a professional co-op space Mm -hmm. where I was actually earning um, pretty much the same but I was getting work experience And so when you look at, you know, I was making $21 an hour. A lot of my friends at that time were probably making minimum wage or they were Mm -hmm. serving, maybe getting some tips. And minimum wage back then was what? Maybe $10? Well, I don't know when you were doing it, but when I was doing it, it was just over 10 bucks. And then when I was serving, we had the lowered uh, minimum wage as well to account for tips. Yeah. And that's going to, you know, already start to show a discrepancy in, how much school you can pay for, right? Mm-hmm. If you're responsible for your entire degree and you're making $11 or I guess now it would be $15 mm-hmm. an hour, then 
you're going to find yourself in a position where you're not able to pay as much as the person earning $20 or $25. Mm-hmm. Because when you actually look at it, $5 an hour over over a year is like $20,000. So mm-hmm. that's, you know, over a summer is going to be an additional five grand you could pay towards mm-hmm. your school. Yeah. Or five grand that would allow you to take time off from working during exam season or the ability to maybe not work for one semester and increase your grades and maybe get a scholarship next time around. So when I think when you look at it that way, there's there's no way around it. Women are starting off as more of a dis- disadvantage than men are. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're using credit and debt to fill that gap. For sure. I know for myself, I was like the queen of side hustle back in the day. Mm-hmm. I guess I still have a couple of side hustles, less so now because my full-time job is more than full-time hours. But, you know, I was a nanny and I was really fortunate that that position during school paid really well and it was flexible. Um, I worked for an organization a couple nights a week. You know, at that point I was starting to get paid for writing. And so if you can actually find something that uh, you're good at, maybe you're in an arts program and you're good at writing, or maybe you want to edit this podcast, or, you know, you have editing skills or what have you. If you start to build that portfolio, you know, when you're 18, 19, 20, by the end of your university, you actually might have a solid side hustle that's going to pay you more than, you know, minimum wage at a retail store. And that can, I guess, be one way that we could start to look at filling a little bit of that gap obviously it's not perfect Mm -hmm. but you you know as a freelancer you do get to set your own hours true I think coming from looking at steady paycheck minimum wage versus freelance income because I've done both when you have bills that are due it's sometimes worth it just to make a little bit less money work a little bit um, of a lower paying job that's not as mentally taxing when you're in school I definitely made that choice. For sure. Yeah. I, I guess more maybe for me, it was more of like a, a supplement. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have to take on as many shifts at, mm-hmm. as, at minimum wage. I had enough that would cover the cost of living. And then on top of that, I would take on freelance work. Yeah. So um, we've kind of already started talking about this, but I was thinking about what can we do? So we've kind of talked about the individual ways that you can look at this by trying to get your employer to pay for it, using different kinds of debts, um, lowering your cost of living. We briefly talked about staying at home versus living away from home. We talked about doing the side hustle, working while you're in school. Scholarships. Scholarships, bursaries, all that kind of stuff. But I was thinking overall, when we look at the big problem of student debt and student debt that we have in this country and and all over the world, we're looking at wage stagnation. We're looking at wage gaps. We're we're looking at <laughs> being, uh, you know, people being marginalized and disproportionately affected by this thing. So, what do you think the main problem is? Is it the cost of post secondary education? What do you think it is? I think it's both. I think it's the cost of post secondary education with stagnating wages. Mm-hmm. Stagnating. Is that the right word? Sure. (laughs) We're going with that. But when I look at over a long period of time, how much university has gone up, Mm -hmm. and I think I've said this before, but my mom and I have very similar careers, and she was able to save up for her university in the summer, Mm -hmm. the four months she worked in the summer, and that wouldn't have never have been a possibility for me. But we both started at the same kind of job level and my wage was double what hers was 30 years before but my schooling was probably six or seven times the cost Mm -hmm. of what it would have cost her and you know I like I said I'm very open I was very fortunate that my parents paid for my post-secondary but I don't think it should just be people whose parents can pay for their post-secondary that get to go to Mm post-secondary so to me we have had this huge issue with wage stagnation and that needs to be fixed on a broader scale but When it comes to post-secondary, I firmly believe having a more educated society is beneficial. So Mm -hmm. adopting something like many European countries do where it costs $300 to go to school for the year, Mm -hmm. I think is overall would be incredibly beneficial for our society and would get some people that maybe can't afford university but have brilliant minds and brilliant ideas and haven't been able to get ahead because they can't go to post-secondary would give them Mm -hmm. an advantage and a leg up. Yeah, definitely. I I really like that idea of a public post-secondary education or a little bit more of a balance on that. I think the whole structure of academia would have to change though. So For sure. there's that. One thing I was going to mention and bring up is, and I think that this gets harder and harder as 
wages stay the same, but, you know, a lot of personal finance gurus or experts say, you know, don't take out more student debt than you're going to make in your first year Mm. after you graduate. But I think you know, we saw that the average is what, twenty six, twenty eight thousand dollars a year. And again, mm-hmm. that's the average. So people are probably in the thirties would be my guess. A lot of people would end up with thirty thousand dollars of student loan debt if they're paying for their whole degree. Mm-hmm. But if you're making thirty thousand dollars when you come out or less than that or what have you, maybe you need to take out more because you had living costs and you're only mm-hmm. making forty grand, it kind of seems like it's not possible long term to do that. Yeah, and I think then you start valuing um, certain programs over the other when the cost of instruction remains the same. So then why should we just have a bunch of people with business degrees or engineers or like anything like that? Like there is value in other degree programs. There is substantial value to our whole uh, society as a whole with having diversity, diversity of thought and everything like that. So I don't, yeah, I I don't agree. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. I think, you know, if we had just a province of engineers, we would be kind of screwed in our way of thinking because people that go into similar degree programs typically have the same, similar line of thinking. So, you know, you're right. We do benefit hugely from having science majors and arts majors and music majors and business majors and engineers Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. that we can start to solve these problems. So I, I guess that's kind of maybe like a myth I wanted to bust that was kind of you know full circle right Mm -hmm. episode one was busting myths but it was something that you know has been bugging me for a while yeah and that's been bugging me too I'm glad that you um that you brought it up one other thing that I just want to touch on before we go there's been talk about loan forgiveness what do you feel about government loan forgiveness go Elizabeth Warren (laughs) (laughs) I totally think that loan forgiveness should be a thing if if there's situations where you have, you know, loans similar to what you would see in the U.S. We've talked a lot about, you know, the fact that student loans can help your credit and I guess teach you some financial means and metrics of, you know, repaying loans and budgeting. So I think that's good. Where I see loan forgiveness needed is where it's the cost of making those repayments are so large that they're going to hinder someone financially. So, Mm -hmm. you know, $200 a month, if you're making $50,000 a year, I don't think that maybe that person should get loan forgiveness. And I know this answer could be like, how do you decide who gets loan forgiveness? But, you know, someone who's making $50,000 a year and has to pay $1,000 a month, maybe they need some loan forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I like that. I think, I don't know if loan forgiveness is the way to get out of this problem. I don't necessarily know if public post-secondary is the way to get out of this problem. It kind of seems yeah. like a band-aid. Mm-hmm. But I think these conversations need to happen and at a wider scale and at a national level because it is a problem. And we're going to end up just having a bunch of people who either can't afford higher education and that's not good for our, for our society as a whole or we have people that are choosing degree paths that don't fit with them just because that's where the income versus debt that they need to get a higher education makes sense well and if it's taking people you know 10 years to pay off their student loans or 14 and they're making huge payments how do you even go about getting a house if that's something that you want or a car mm-hmm. or what have you and, you know, setting yourself up for retirement? If, it, if it's going to take you 10 or 14 years, you're almost in, no, you are in your 30s at that mm-hmm. point. And hopefully people have started to have a little bit of a financial path forward by the time they're in their 30s. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if, if they're if it's so astronomically expensive to go to school, affording the rest of your life is going to be even maybe you put off having children and you know that's a whole nother yeah. kettle of fish. Well, and I was going to say it's really better for everyone to have more kids because we need tiny future taxpayers. For so, sure. For sure. There's that. So I guess we'll skip to our pink tax rebate. To fix this problem, I think what we need to do is speak out about the rising tuition costs, become politically active, and see what you can do to support others in your life that are dealing with massive student debt. Thanks for listening to the last episode of season one. If you guys enjoyed this episode and the season, make sure you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And, you know, if you have any questions that you want us answered, hit us up on social media. And we look forward to coming back for season two. Yay! 
We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. As always, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave a five-star review. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to share your money story using the hashtag FemFinances.